I find these experiences are quite good because I think, oh, what should I get him for Christmas this year? And then I get yeah. him something thinking, well, he won't want to go on his own. So. No. <laughs> okay, it's Saturday morning and it's brew house and kitchen time. Hi, guys, just walking down and we're doing some brewing today. We're off to uh, brew house and kitchen, make some beer, learn from the pros. Just looking forward to it. Looking forward to meeting Phil as well. See you soon. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, I can't wait. We're having a beer with mate and brewing some stuff. Up in our game. Up in our game. Up in right. our game. See you in a bit. We've arrived, Phil. Brew us a kitchen. Brew us a kitchen. This is, I would like to say this is the earliest time I've been to a pub in the morning. Uh, it was 10. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> We are actually producing work today, probably about 10 days time. We'll add some more hops and we'll also cold crash the fermenter as well. And that'll bring fermentation to a halt. This white um, powder, and you can see that sort of like flower stuff there. Um, this is basically the um, sugars inside the drink. So it's actually um, converted during the mash to fermentable sugars. Um, but these grains have all been um, crushed down in a mill which basically means that we can extract and access those sugars with the water. This is where we both go back in. Well, what temperature are we mashing at? Uh, so we're mashing at 75 degrees, um, but what we're going to be doing is, obviously the temperature of the grain and also the temperature in the room as well, bring that down yeah. to about 60 degrees. How does it feel to be brewing beer, man? Yeah, good. Hard work. <laughs> so what we've done is we've mixed the grains and the water together and that's a practical part but then there's also a little bit of education coming in as well. I've drawn a little scale here for you um, where we're going between 60 and 70 degrees. Um, sorry for the size of it, it's just I've got a lot to draw on the So um, 60 to 70 degrees and on either end of the spectrum we've got access or slightly more access to a different enzyme. I mentioned enzymes earlier. Um, at the lower end of the temperature spectrum, or uh, the scale, we've got um, something known as beta amylases, which are um, further extractable um, on the grain. Um, and what they are is basically like a little chain of sugars, um, which get broken down very easily during fermentation. So I mentioned earlier, you've got um, the lower end where you'll get thin and dry beers, and the higher end where you'll get thicker, more um, velvety, creamy beers. Mm. So these um, little strains of sugars, they're called maltodextrins, and they get broken down um, very easily during fermentation into little um, mouth, mouthfuls, essentially. So the yeast is eating the sugar as a meal. Um, those little sugar strains, then obviously, they're more manageable to eat. Do they get that, complete conversion, those ones? Yeah, more or less complete conversion between um, the start of fermentation through to the end. Um, whereas, that, that's why they're known as um, high, high fermentable sugar. Um, then at the higher end of the temperature, between 65 and 70 degrees, we're looking at um, a larger strain of sugar, um, which has little links that these ones can actually link onto. Um, so this is just called a dextro sugar, and you usually find those between 65 and 70 degrees. They do sort of veer off towards the lower end as well, um, but these are what actually bring um, body to a bit. So you've got um, if you think of like a, an imperial stout, or even just stouts in general, sometimes they can be quite thick, um, especially with New England IPAs as well, they're also very thick, and that's because they're mashed usually at a higher temperature, as well as having a different combination of ingredients and cereal grains, um, which can affect the body of the beer too. But if you have that, the, the yeast basically breaks down these sugars, but it doesn't do a full conversion, so it'll end up turning it into more of just like a really jagged lump of sugar because they've eaten all that they can and they're as full as they can be. So they have no more room to eat. So that means that the sugars are left over. So these are known as less fermentable sugars. Um, and so like I said, they're more accessible between 65 and 70 degrees. But that being said, there is a bit of a cross up point where each of these sugars kind of dips off towards either end. So you can still access the alpha amylases towards the lower end, but you'll get less of them as you get to the pollen. And the same, but in reverse from bottom, from the B family. Um, but there is always a kind of a perfect crossover point, which is usually about 65 degrees. And so that's why 65 degrees is more or less the ideal matching point, because that will end up giving you the best of both worlds. You'll have a thick, 
flash thin, flash perfectly down the middle. Yeah. Now feel. Whilst it's also being a bit, a little bit too dry, but also not too sweet. So it's, it's a perfect blend of both. It's circulating the work. Yeah. So the liquid that we put inside the mashtub. Yeah. Yeah. So that is extracting from the bottom pipe, going through this big loop of pipe work, and then into what's known as an underpack. Um, underpack's basically in other big, big breweries you get side glasses, uh, which have a like, inline visual um, sort of quality control box. Um, we can have that sort of going into here and then it's pumping back through this hose up through to the top of the mash tun. That's where we had all of our um, water coming up from earlier. Yeah. But I've now reattached our spa jar. Um, so we'll be looking out for any grains that have pulled through. You know, I pointed out the false bottom, those three plates with slats mm -hmm. in the sort of mash tun. So any grains that have pulled through there, um, we can look for colour, we can also smell, we can also take a little tasting sample. Um, but we'll also take another sample of work for a gravity reading. Um, and that's where we can identify how much sugar we've extracted from the grains. What gravity are you looking for? This running should be probably about 67 to 72. Just because we want to, you know, we want to <laughs> check your work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that's word going back through at the moment. That's and, are you... inside the underback, going through the pump, back up to the top. Back up. And how long would you do that for? Um, Recirculation for me usually takes about 10 to 15 minutes, um, but I, well, the longer you do it, the better. First one in. What's your name, Dan? Alright, who is that? Next we have the gods. Monty? Oh, Monty? Sugary? Sugary? Sure. Need, need them hot. Very sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't drink much of it. Nah. I couldn't drink much of it. But it's very, very sweet and smooth. Please, 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 please. Cheers, man. Back to the brew. Oh, expertly done, man. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? The spa jar won't be rotating anymore because there's no pressure going through it. We're going to transfer it to the kettle, and that's where we're going to bring it up to the boil. And during the boil, we'll be able to add our hops, um, which are one of the fundamental flavours for a golden ale. Um, light, citrusy. Um, Poppy are the three words I would use to describe the gold layer. Sorry, I mean, the lens might steam up a little bit, but... It's nearly empty. <laughs> nearly empty there, so see the element there at the back. So, yeah, we're draining off from the bottom, um, and that's going up through the pump, all the way up into the top of our mash tun, um, which is where it's then sparging through the grains. Um, that's a really important process so that we can actually access the rest of the, the sugars inside the grains that haven't been washed out yet, um, so that we can uh, get a maximized full batch volume as well. Pour them out so as you get 200 grams. How much would you put one of those pounds to Usually about 85 to 100 pounds. We're ready to put these into the boil. Um, now these hops, obviously we tasted them. They've got a really bitter flavor. Um, so during the boil, the purpose of adding hops at this point is to extract that bitterness and that is going to then seep into the work. All right, so we're going to be emptying out the mash tun now. Um, it's all done by emptying out of the front hatch of the, of the mash. Wow! There we go. Wow, that is cool. Only two volunteers, well, three in total. We need one right hand, one left hand and one bigger. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, is this 75 kilos? Yeah. Yeah. Enjoying the job there, Max? Yeah. We complain, but uh, yeah, this is a three man cleaning process. In there, son. Okay. What we need is a small child to climb in now. <laughs> what you got, Dan? Putting the hops in, measuring the hops. One kilogram. This is commercial, I have to get it right for the comic mistakes. You see, touching it, Phil. That's <laughs> very, very efficient. Fine running. That's the piss weak one, isn't it? We're aiming for about 10 15 to 10 20. Um, probably. Yeah. There we go, 10 19. So that means we've had a really efficient uh, rinse down. Sparge has been on point. Pre boiled grab them. This is the one that we actually want to pay attention to. But this one is the really the first one that actually matters. I mean, they all matter, but um, so we'll have water to liquor it down. So, 10.58, that's our pre-boiled gravity. Wow. Uh, make a note of that. Could you do it slower? 
<laughs> um, so this is protoflock. Um, it is protoflock. Um, what it is is essentially um, seaweed that has been burnt, and then the ashes have been collected and compiled into one small tablet. Now, if you have a little smell of these, um, they're really smoky and aroma, um, and that's just to just to show that they have been a uh, sort of burnt up to the, to the stage where they are. Do you know what? I thought this was just a thing for homebrewers. No. I didn't think protoflock was used on a commercial scale at all. And that causes a bubble up if you watch the... And it, it stinks as well, doesn't it? It's nasty. Oh, it's <laughs> it gets all the solids together um, because it is a negatively charged um, subject. And inside here, because of all the energy there is a lot of positive energy. Um, and so they kind of attract each other. The next step is called the whirlpool, um, for a very obvious reason. Um, it literally spins all of the work around. Um, through centrifugation, all of the solids will either be sent to the outside or they'll be sucked into the middle because it's vortex. Um, and because of that, they'll drop down to the bottom and then they'll settle along the bottom of the, um, the kettle. Um, from that point on, we'll then be taking out of the, uh, the outlet valve there at the back um, and then we'll be transferring it across to the bottom end where all of the solids will be below that valve. But then we'll also have um, all of the clear work, hopefully above that. Alright, so sanitizing is done. We've hooked up from the kettle to the kettle. Done. We are now about to start the whirlpool. Would you mind opening that valve? Work going from the back of it into the front or into the underback. Um, and from that point, we've also got it going back out into the pump yeah. where it's forced through this line and then back in through the valve in the front here. Oh. Okay, so it's, this is again just kind of another recirculation um, like we did with the mash earlier, um, but we're recircling the work back into the kettle and yeah. forcing it to spin around. Okay. Um, so, Rich, again, can you start the uh, CIP pump, please? Things are not the same. Into the kettle. So we're adding 100 litres of water. We've got on the DFD pump. Yeah. Yep. We've got it on. On the DFD pump. Three. So when this comes in, does it go in just straight across the bottom? Um, or is it, is it directed in there? Is it's it... directed so it goes around in there. It kind of comes out like an oval shape, so it's cut into the side of the metal. Right, right, right. What's your job done? I have to wait for the liquid to come up and then I need to uh, put the knock it off. The knock it off? Knock it off. I got, I got pull and lift. Pull and lift. Okay. I, I didn't think you were, you were exactly sure which knob you were supposed to pull then, though. No, I was supposed to pull one, I should be right. What's my job? What's your job? What's your more job you got? So, my job is uh, operating a pump. Pump operator? Yeah, pump operator. We're <laughs> up in the world. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, now you are. It's the uh, CIP pump. And now, Dan, just keep coming out. So, sanitizer can come out. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
Uh, Absolutely. So 250 gram. Uh, but what we do is we just pour it in there. And we'll sanitize uh, a spoon or a knife or something, uh, a metal implement, so it's it sanitized easily rather than water that's where it's porous. Pour that mist in. So here we are, and we've just done a massive brew day with the excellent <laughs> Alex. It was awesome. Uh, commercial brew, 500 litres. 500, 500. Can you give us some uh, tips about uh, what what the home brewers need to consider in order to take their beer to the next level? Yeah, um, honestly, the, the the one thing I would absolutely say is just have faith in yourself. Mm. Um, everyone started from nowhere, and if you can learn how to make beer, yeah. then absolutely you've got it. You've got the willpower, you've got the uh, commitment to it, and just trust the process. Yeah. Um, that's how I got to the stage where I'm at now, and absolutely just, in terms of key top tips, yeah. um, sanitation or sanitization is absolutely everything. Yeah. Um, you need a clean brewery, you need to be respectful of your equipment, and your equipment will respect you. Yeah. Uh, that's how I've always looked at it. What sort of beers should uh, we start off when we start start starting brewing, sort of all grain, and how we should how, how we should progress? You know, any thoughts around that? I started brewing with uh, smash beers, yes. uh, so single malt and single hop, yeah. um, and they really let you break down what the flavour of malts are and what the flavours of hops are um, yeah. post fermentation. So you can actually uh, establish like a similar connection from if you do like multiple smash brews, yeah. you could do like. Um, a citra smash brew, yes. and you could do a mosaic smash brew, yeah. and then you could compare the two of them together. So, just trying to understand the ingredients and absolutely what, yeah. break it down step by step, um, yeah. and actually get to know what the ingredients are that you're using. So long as you've got the right materials, you've got the right um, equipment, and it's clean, then yeah. the quality of your beer will be absolutely yeah. phenomenal. So, I got a, one question. For, well, just one question for you, yep. but, but it's split into two parts. What's your favourite favourite grain to brew with? And um, what's your favourite favourite hop to brew with? My oh okay all right so my Followed favourite yeast. <laughs> yeast wise I don't have an answer for that. Um, no absolutely so my favourite grain to brew with would easily be Crystal Light. Um, just brings such a nice nuttiness, um, really nice sort of light toasted roasted uh, toffee flavours to the beer as well. Yeah. Um, but especially when used in a small quantity, yeah. mix that with a bit of pale malt in there as well, and it, well majority pale malt and then a small bit of uh, of light crystal and it's just a perfect combination and it gives a really nice crystal yeah. clear colour as well um, and then my favourite hop would absolutely be mosaic um, yes yeah and if I'm completely honest that's entirely the recipe for my session IPA yeah, back yeah. in Cheltenham yeah. um, well, well a bit of crystal <laughs> bit of pale, pale yeah, and mosaic yeah, yeah, yeah. all it is keep it simple keep it effective absolutely yeah. simple and effective yeah, is yeah. The way Alex yeah. will you send me that recipe and can we brew it on a very small scale <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yes, yeah. absolutely no issues. <laughs> when we did do, do brewing today, we used the app to help with different calculations and things like that. So yeah. just about the thought of using an app or using a calculator to help you make the, the brews and stuff like that, if you have any comments on Yeah, that. Uh, again, so brewing aids, they're there to be used. If there's a piece of equipment that will do the thing for you, let it do the thing. Yeah. Um, and obviously you've designed that app as yeah. well, yeah. Um, which... Link uh, it up. Yeah, <laughs> download it, it's fantastic. That app is, it does all of the ABV equations, it does the um, liquor back dilution rates, um, it, it tells you everything you yeah. need to know. Yeah. And by that point, if you've got the, uh, the calculations correct and you've got your uh, brewing equipment profiles correct, you can't go wrong. Yeah. So trust the technology, trust the knowledge, yeah. trust yeah. these yeah. guys. Yeah. Alex, Fantastic. you've been awesome today. Yeah. Thank you very much. I've so thank enjoyed you. myself. Yeah. Thank you very it's much. Really, yeah, really good. I've it's been job. better yeah. than and, I've. And welcome, uh, yeah, thank you for coming to Cardiff as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I will be back. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. This is Cheltenham Brewer. Check yeah. him out on the yeah. Chel <laughs> Cheltenham Kitchen and uh, Brew House.